Glad that uh, we're here tonight. Thank you for taking this class on This is Romans. This is the eighth part of our study in Romans. Tonight we'll be in chapter 13, and we'll be learning about why we should have a good attitude to respect government and government authority. And then this chapter closes with the Christian conscience, and there is a connection as well between that and our relationship to the government. So we're in Romans chapter 13, and as we begin tonight, I'd like to ask our brother Edgar, yes. could you please lead us out in prayer as we Let's begin? Pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here learning about the book of Romans, and especially tonight that we'll, we will be addressing the government, and uh, now that we have the election right in front of us, Lord, that you will take place tomorrow in the elections, and the uh, the person that will be appointed as president of the United States will be according to your will. We pray for everyone uh, that is uh, going to be voting tomorrow for this class, for everything that we have learned and we will learn in the near future uh, now that we are taking these classes, Lord. Please bless us all going back home tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we can be assured that whatever happens tomorrow, God is God. Amen. And he will still be on the throne on Wednesday. Amen. And Jesus will still come back. Yes. And Jesus will come back and set up a perfect kingdom. Amen. And until Thank then, you. there are no perfect kingdoms and definitely no perfect kings. And we have some very um, imperfect people to choose from. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> so may God help yes. us. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, and I'd like for us to read verses 1 through 8 as we begin here. And so uh, we'll start with Edgar, and we'll just go across the table here. Good night, Marilyn. Good night, Get a good rest, yes. and have a good day tomorrow. Okay, Romans okay. chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the, order, the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience. For this cause pay tribute also. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. <coughs> honor to whom honor. Amen. Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the Okay. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covenant, and if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, Amen. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we could stop right there. All right, so let's look at this passage, and I've entitled it Good Reasons to Respect Government. And I have a few reasons here. And we, we need government because all of us are sinners. And sin produces crime. So just to introduce this, I have different factors that influence or even result in the increase of crime. And what are some of them? Number one, mental illness. Those who have mental illness are often breakers of the law. Number two, economic pressures. Remember what the writer in Proverbs said, he said, Make me neither too rich or too poor. You know, if I do be too rich, I'll just think I won't need you. If I do be too poor, I'll, I'll steal. And so economic pressures are an influence the increase of crime. Number three, social and environmental influences. 
social and environmental influences. And number four, educational failures. Now often psychiatry and even government deals with all deals with these aspects but the ultimate reason for crime is we're sinners while these and other factors are, are right do influence crime ultimately crime is due to the universal sinfulness of man and man is responsible for his actions but this passage of scripture now deals with every person's relationship and response to governing authorities human society cannot exist peacefully without laws there was a society that did not have any form of human government and it ended in a worldwide flood <laughs> and with the establishing of laws of government is what we would believe government is ordained of God and exists to maintain order with just laws to repress crime preserve liberty and protect God-given rights so in this section, let's, let's look at a few of these reasons to respect human government. Number one, it honors God. That's the first point. It honors God. He says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. Now, who does that include? <laughs> yeah, everyone with the suke, everyone with the breath, everyone with breath to be subject. That is, and I, I have the definition. I'm not going to read all these definitions, but I have them here. The word subject means to be under the authority. It's a military term. The higher th powers is, is not, uh, don't think Alcoholic Anonymous here, you know, have a higher power, but it's the idea of a governing authority, a governing power. They are higher than us. In that sense but what does this say there's no power but of God the powers that be are ordained of God so letter a is who's the ultimate authority God God, God is the okay. ultimate authority at the bottom there underlying the word human governments have delegated authority underlying delegated so human governments really are well, not they are under the authority of God, and they have a delegated authority by the sovereign creator, who is the ultimate and legitimate source of authority. All authority and dominion proceeds from Him. And Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Jeannie, could you read those verses, please? At the top of page, you have to read them in your Bible there in, in the notes. You could just read them right over there, please. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Okay, so take encouragement. <laughs> Whatever happens tomorrow, if not the right person doesn't get elected, God will remove him eventually. And he'll set somebody else up. God removes and God sets up. God is God over every king. He is the king of kings now where in the Bible does a person in the Bible show respect for human government what's a what's a, who shows respect for human government in the Bible what's the illustration of that David okay David yes Jesus how did David do that's a good one because he could have easily uh, going up against Saul try and respect it and, and allow God to Himself even though Saul was a very wicked man Saul was trying to kill him but David said I will not touch God's anointed that's an excellent example who, who else Jesus. okay Jesus mm -hmm. you were looking at your notes right no no <laughs> yo you were, okay. <laughs> what did Jesus say oh yeah that's right yeah <laughs> yeah there has to be another fish with money in it. Yeah, yeah you know that shows the omniscience of jesus right i mean he knew if they went out fishing and that's what that's not a coincidence is it you know just at that right moment of it i mean what's the chances of that you know anyway okay so render to caesar and then jesus also when he was before Pilate, told Pilate what 
You could have no power, that's exercise or authority against me, except that we're given the, Jesus recognized that Pilate got his authority from his father. Okay, who else? Who else? Joseph, thank you very much. <laughs> you were going to say Joseph? Yeah, okay, Joseph. Joseph recognized whose authority? A pharaoh. A pharaoh. Daniel. And Daniel rose to power in the in a pagan kingdom. And he respected those authorities that he served along with. You know who respected authority? Samuel. Remember the people wanted a king. Did Samuel want a king? No. no. But what did God tell Samuel to do? Give him a king. Samuel, in a sense, anointed the king against his own conscience or will. I thought that's pretty interesting. Someone, uh, I, I, I read a blog on how somebody is going to vote for a particular person tomorrow and he's not like fully at peace in his conscience. And that's, he, he, he used that as an illustration. I thought that was pretty interesting. I think really whoever you're going to vote for, it's not like we're, we have perfect candidates here, right? So um, that he used that. He used that Saul uh, passage. I, I thought that was pretty interesting. So God's the ultimate authority. Let her be. God has established the principle of governing authorities. That's letter B, the principle of governing authorities. There's no power but of God. All powers that be are ordained. And a good word for ordained, a synonym there, is appointed. God has ultimately, he is the one who has appointed these powers. What about the person who's born in a communist country and the communist dictator is putting Christians in jail? God has appointed him. So Can a person live for Jesus Christ if they're born in a communist socialist, under a communist socialist government? Does the Bible say, for those of you born under communism and socialism, we understand it's too difficult for you to live for Jesus? No. No. Isn't it amazing that the Bible doesn't say, now this is the kind of government that all the kings should have, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't say that it's going to be easier if your king believes a certain thing, then you should be more. No, it says God has appointed that and we can all live for Jesus. No matter what government we're born into, it might be more difficult, no doubt, for those who are born in pure tyranny. So if the will of the people, let's say what American will do, right? The will of the people does one way, right? Is it God that's appointed, or is it God allowing, or do they work the same, in the same way? Yeah. The same way, like Samuel's anointing Saul against his own will, not where it would lead to. Here's the will of the people. We want this person to lead us. We want whatever that is. And is he appointing that person, or does it work hand in hand with allowing and saying, the people have chosen this. I'll give right. you what you're asking for. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will agree with you. Um, there's that whole right wing I believe that God gives uh, a leader that the people do deserve in that sense. And I think I think both. I mean, in the in the Old Testament, for example, God raised up a pagan man, Cyrus. He was a servant, and then God used Cyrus to have Israel brought out of the Babylonian captivity when Cyrus. Persian king defeated Babylon. God also raised up Nebuchadnezzar. And in Jeremiah, I was actually reading, and it's a really good passage related to all this. Jeremiah was preaching to the people, submit to Babylon, submit to the king of Babylon and be at peace. If you don't submit to Babylon, you are going to have chains and captivity and so forth. And of course, the people didn't listen to Jeremiah. But God told him, God raised up Nebuchadnezzar. You know, um, but he also raised up kings to attack Israel. Right. Yeah. Who understands all the working of God? You know, so there the, is a mystery. There is a mystery. So here's on the right, because of the next one, on this superior right wing Christian thing, right, where you hear these people submit to, but you hear them say, "I know Trump 
Trump has been anointed by God because, you know, like James Thompson says, he's born again and he said, whatever, whatever, whatever. I mean, when you, when you listen to these people, Christians sound more foolish than they sound. <laughs> Wise. Yeah, well, that, that's going to a bit to, a, to an extreme, you know, I, I would have to say. But, yeah. What, what, was, what was the answer? What was the answer? Yeah, that was a good that was one. That was one answer. That's it. Measure. It's you. Oh. Because you just you have those voices out there. Yeah. yeah. I believe that America is under the judgment of God. That we are, we have become a reprobate culture. And ultimately, we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. I have a preference in this section, but my preference is not going to help this nation get to where it really needs to go and be. You know, we need a revival, we need repentance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a part of me that loves this country and wants it to get back to its uh, original constitutional moorings and roots. And I, I believe it is shifting away from its constitutional intent, the intent of the original con the, uh, writers of the Constitution. So, you know, I mean, as a citizen, I'm, you know, I think I can be concerned about that and pray about it. But ultimately, what difference does it make? I'll just use this as an example. You know, as a Christian, I feel strongly that abortion is murder. Right? So what good does it do, though, if I have a politician who believes he's going to change that? Okay, great. And... And other people change their idea on, on abortion and, and turn from pro-choice to pro-life. But if they're not saved and they're pro-life, still going to hell. <laughs> I mean, I think our main concern should be the salvation of the lost. And when people are saved and the change is coming from the inside out, then the change will happen. Okay. Now, with the changes that we really want to see, I believe, will only actually happen when the change goes on in the heart by the Holy Spirit of God working. But that's not to still say I, I think that we should exercise our vote tomorrow, you know. So, appointed. Letter C, the one who resists the authority rebels against God. And that's in uh, verse 2 there. If whoever resists the power resists the ordinance, that which has been put in order by God has resisted the ordinance of God. I have the definition of that word there, the, the divine arrangement of things that God has ordered. So if they stand against that, they're standing against God. It's the idea there. And then it says and that they will receive to themselves damnation. Now that word damnation, you might want to underline this. This is under, you see where the word damnation is defined? The judgment in view here is earthly and temporal. So it's not, he's not saying that if you resist the ordinance, you're going to die and go to hell. It's not talking about an eternal damnation. I believe he's talking about an earthly judgment. That's the word meaning there. So if they resist the, the ordinance, they're going to they're gonna experience the consequences of breaking that law. So then we get to this question, what about civil disobedience? Certain forms of civil disobedience are sins against God. I mean, bombing abortion clinics. I believe that's a sin. Other forms of disobedience are really foolishness, like this, uh, that Brownsville, what's that, not Brownsville, there's Baptist... Church, that guy died. That guy died. The Westboro people. I mean, that's awful and gives God's people a bad name, especially those who call themselves Baptists. <laughs> I'm amongst them. <laughs> so, that, so some forms of civil disobedience are sins against God. Certain forms of civil disobedience are right when man's laws conflict with God's laws, when human government interferes with your prayer life, worship, and witnesses. We ought to obey God rather than men. There's that verse, Acts 5.29. So what are some examples of civil disobedience in the Bible? Other than the apostles, other than that right there. Daniel. Okay, Daniel, he prayed. 
and he was and God protected him. Okay, right. So from Daniel, we have those two. They did not bow to the to the idol, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. The Egyptian midwives. The Egypt definitely the Egyptian midwives, which I can get into a little trouble on this, but you know what I call that? I say that they, Egypt had nationalized health care. <laughs> and when you when you, <laughs> so, <laughs> you think I'm kind of crazy, but you know what? When people start making, when you start giving over your health decisions to the government, watch out. You don't know what kind of laws they can make. They can make laws that when you're 85 and you start getting Alzheimer's, okay, you have one month to live. We'll have to put you to death now because it's going to cost too much money for you, us to keep you alive. Or if your child has um, some kind of syndrome, a Down syndrome baby, well, your child is going to cause the medical the uh, too much money and now if it's all nationalized we're all paying for your child that has down syndrome so you were just going to have to terminate that pregnancy so what i am saying there are definite consequences i believe when you give over your health to the government according to whatever laws they want to establish well egypt established a law we don't want any male jewish babies born so they said no and moses was born out of that civil disobedience so then, um, was the American Revolution on Okay, and that's what we're going to talk about. I have that right there. That's why I gave you that paper. Okay? So, let me just put, put this, um, let's see here. Okay. So, let me just give you this point two, and then I gave you the paper on that. Point two is God has ordained first the family, secondly, human government, and thirdly, the church to guide, guard, and govern man. So, these are the three institutions God has ordained. And thank you for that question. And the question is, what about the American Revolution? Because and and that's a great question. Because check it out. I was reading Dr. MacArthur, a good American. <laughs> And in, in his, in his uh, chapter on Romans 13, this is what he says. It is not that all, um, no, that's not it. Here it is. It's my page. Okay. Many evangelicals strongly believe that the American Revolution was wholly justified, not only politically, but biblically. And he said another sentence. But then he says, obviously, however, such action is forbidden of God and judged in light of our present text that is that the Christians or, or that the or that, that the Patriots fought against the uh, the British government in the revolution he says such action is forbidden of God and judged in light of our present text it is equally obvious that the United States was born out of violation of scripture so I said wow <laughs> so uh, that got me uh, going and wow I had another paper and I thought it was I thought it was in here and now I can't seem to find it but I did give this another one that was really a well-written piece but nevertheless this deals with that question was the American Revolution a violation of Romans chapter 13 we were not going to read the whole thing here but if you turn on the other side on point one, on the second page, you see what it says? The colonists saw themselves not as anti-government, but as anti-tyranny. And then point two, the colonists pointed out that it was the king of England himself who was in violation of Scripture. No king who behaved so wickedly, they said, could be considered God's servant. Therefore, it was Christian's duty to resist him as Mayhew, and this was a preacher, in 1750. Now, do the calculation. How many years is that before the signing of the Declaration? Exactly. That's quite a few years. So, the British government was tyrannizing the people for many years, and the colonists were appealing, pleading with the British government to listen to their appeals. And what did the, how did the British government respond? They sent British troops here to break into their homes to do other things. So, so this preacher, Jonathan Mayhew, he actually coined one of the Patriots' mottos, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. I, you can actually look that sermon up online, and I did last week. 
It's tough reading. <laughs> but in what way? I'm the language. It's yeah, because of the language. But I will say this, you know what, when you go back and see what these men wrote in the 1700s, do you know what scripture they had? Do you know what scripture they wrestled with? Do you know what scripture they debated? Romans 13. They were not ignorant of it at all. They were very intelligent men, very well learned, very well read. And they battled, they struggled, they, they wrestled with what they were doing. They did not do it lightly. So that's that was the conclusion that rebellion and tyrants obedience to God and then here's point three and this is actually very important even when you look at the history point three is what the colonists saw the war as a defensive action not offensive so they pleaded they sent to the king many formal appeals the peaceful pleas were met with armed military force and one of their sayings too was what don't fire unless fired upon. That was important for them because once they were fired upon, they believed they had the just right to defend themselves. And then I think point five is also interesting. The colonists saw Hebrews 11 as justification for resisting tyrants, and they looked at the judges, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, heroes of faith, who overthrew oppressive governments. So these are some of the things... And I actually went through this a little bit even in my message. I preached on Romans 13 in, my, in our message yesterday. A little different outline and so such, but so sorry for the repeat for those of you who heard that. But um, I really believe that our young people are being taught anti-American values in our educational system today, especially on the college level. And many of them are being taught by elite intellectual professors that America is an illegitimate nation because the because of this very thing so I think I personally defend the the, the, the Patriots I do believe that they were right um, Baptist preachers in that day believe they were right um, many take a broad brush and say they were wrong and plus they were slave owners so they were wicked men you know and they really denigrate them and put them down we don't justify the, the slavery of the early parts of this country, and thank God it was, it was put down. And then, of course, uh, through, through much bloodshed, I have to say, a lot of people shed their blood over that. So anyway, I, I think these are some reasons that to have justified, yeah. Uh, uh, the paragraph four, it says um, that Nero was on the throne and wrote this. So can we compare what Nero was doing to the British government? Or they were treating the colonists. There, there is no uh, well exceptions. Yeah. Well, I think too. Well, again, I think that you know. I wonder if how distant has a matter of it. You know, it's like why should somebody way over there, who doesn't even live, he's not even living here where I am, tell me what to do? You know, whereas the Roman government was at least in. And around that that whole general area you know so you know we weren't in their shoes I have to say I believe the, the, the and the war they fought and the result of it brought about the most free and the most prosperous and the most unique and I'm gonna use this word exceptional government based on its constitution that has ever been on the face of this earth and I use that word exceptional, not better than anyone else, but an exception to everyone else. The American government, that the power is really invested not in the, not in the politicians, but in the who. It's the government for the people and by the people. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, that's how it was worked out. And that we should, the government protects our rights so that we can pursue what? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Government is so to protect you so that you can work and pursue life, liberty, and happiness. That's the exception to all government. Basically, in other governments, you exist to make the king rich and, and you're under his boot, you know? So I think the result of it was a wonderful result and we are, we've are we all tasted the, the blessing of it too. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think we can wrestle with it. 
you know, definitely Audrey, you know, can wrestle with it. And you know what, even in the colony, don't you think there was different, don't you think everybody agreed with what the American uh, patriots wanted to do? No, obviously some were pro-British, even at the time, you know? So, um, I think it's interesting oh, yeah, to yeah. look at all that stuff so analytically, biblically. I mean, they're really studying that. Because in today's Christian culture, you, people don't have that same depth. They're not looking at it, you know, from those deep things. And I've just always thought that once you get into persecution, once the stuff all of a sudden it's your life or not, your theology becomes, you're going to really look at this stuff deeply. But your theology is no longer like this head game. It's like, what do you need to do? And allow the Holy Spirit to lead you to what is appropriate. But right now, it's in America, it's just all these arguments, all these whatever. If you, it's a family, family Christian yeah. society. Right? And the kids today, such an illiteracy today about the Bible, and people don't even read today, you know? They're just playing video games. And, um, and they don't <laughs> it's amazing. But these men back then, they, they read the great philosophers, yes. the, the great thinkers. They, they, were, they were learned. Um, another thing, too, another point, actually, I didn't make here, but with Romans 13.3, the colonists, the patriots, said that Romans 13.3 had been inverted by the British government. In other words, the government here is to make rules and laws so that the evil are put into fear. And that the good are praised. And the colonists says the British government twisted that around so that the evil were praised and the good were put into terror of the government. Um, so they, they said it was unjust government. But then you do, you get back to what Peter said in First Peter chapter 2, honor the king. And who was the king? <laughs> you know, Nero, not exactly a Christian person. What I would say to that, though, too, I don't believe that. It is the church's, let's say our government got to a point where it's like, we, we want to have a revolution, you know? And, and actually our founders said that if we could. <laughs> but I don't believe that the church should be a political action toward it. I believe the church should keep its ultimate focus, which is the Great Commission, winning the loss. Because the best government in the world is not going to do that. And the worst government in the world cannot keep us from that. Our job is to preach the gospel, see people saved, fulfill the Great Commission, make disciples, baptize them, and start churches. That's our job. That's what we need to do as a church. Whether there's a political movement outside the church that gets to that point, then I think individuals in the church will have to wrestle just like the early patriots did. So I, I kind of see that's how it played out. I don't think it's the church's job to be a political movement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, the church can have a political stance. Um, and before you kneel, I know Mondello, you had your hand up earlier. Did you want to say yes. something? Well, basically, the, the anti tyranny argument can kind of lead to a global regime change mm -hmm. just because I think most countries have wonderful sounding you know, versions of the Constitution or whatever. I mean, you read it, the documents sound wonderful, and most leaders don't buy by it. So if you say, well, King George didn't buy by this, and you can say that against this dictator, this dictator, this regime, this government. So it, it can kind of be very, you know, unstable, you know, stability challenging globally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Well, I, I, I think, think, I think uh, honestly, though, I would just have to say yeah. a revolution against our American government, the way the the way the military and the <laughs> the weapons that they have, I, and plus the out, I, I don't see anyone actually ever, you know, that happening again. Uh, Neil? Yeah, uh, I mean, following up on what you're saying, so if you listen to a Christian radio station now, I mean, they have their opinions which are really no less biased than, than other media, other newspapers, other magazines. I mean, they, they're very outright in, what, in terms of what they believe. In what way? What do you mean? Politically. Oh. You know, yeah. Who you should vote for tomorrow. Yeah. They're they no less biased. In, in, and they justify it by the platform. But if you look at 
either candidate. Each one is wrong in, in their own way. You know, each one is wrong in their own way. Anyhow, um, for example, so Joseph, was he uh, an example of civil disobedience because he wouldn't um, sleep with the, the wife? No, I don't think that was civil disobedience because she was not a an officer. She of the of the she just wanted you know to have a adulterous affair with him. No, so I, I don't think that was a civil disobedience. That was moral obedience. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, that's a big question. So I thought that's good that we take a few minutes for that. Let's look at point three. To receive praise from the government. The government exists, letter A, to do what? What does A say? To restrain evil, and B is to promote good. So underline those two points. So to receive praise from the government. You know what I thought of? Praise, praise. praise. Verse uh, 3 says, thou shalt have praise. If you do good, you shall have praise. You know what I thought of? I thought of a medal of honor. Have you ever seen a Medal of Honor recipient get the award? The president puts it around. It's very solemn, dignified. He's getting praise from the government. And what does that do? I think that it motivates me. I would love to. I know I never will, but, you know. <laughs> but my when my wife's brother's funeral in Connecticut over the summer, he had been a volunteer firefighter in his town. And at his funeral, there were like six other fire departments from around that went to the funeral. And there was like 150 firefighters there. And they were, you know, they did the gun salute and, and everything. And they they did the thing around the, the, the cemetery. And it made me, want, I was like, man, I should have been a firefighter, you know? <laughs> I mean, I mean so when I die, you get a really good funeral. I'm going to get some podunk Baptist funeral, you know? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? No, but it, it was it was motivating to do civil service because police officers and firefighters they know how to do funerals. Do you agree with me? When a police officer dies, it's amazing, you know. And when elected officials die, it's a, they do they do it upright and big. So I think that's to promote praise. So number three is to avoid punishment from the government. Now, when it says, he is the minister of God to thee for good, who is that he? Who is, you know what word is used for minister? A deacon, a diakonos. <laughs> so he is a minister of God. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. He beareth not the sword of vain. He's the minister of God. So it says twice there, he's the minister of God. To revenge, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So to avoid punishment from the government, we respect, we we obey, so we should respect government because it honors God. We receive praise from the government, and we avoid punishment. That's a good thing. <laughs> Do you want to go to jail? I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> Man, thank God I've never had to spend a night in jail. So who's the minister of God here? Who's the minister of God? The uh, ruler. Who in the, okay, and who else? Who, so the, the president is the minister of God, right? You would say, agree with that? Yeah. So who else? Everyone under the president that has been delegated some legal authority under the president. So, again, I used some of these illustrations yesterday. But So what if you have a 911 call and a thief has broken into your house and he's got a gun and you call 911 and then he cocks the gun and he's going to he's going to shoot you and the police come in you know who he is he's the minister of god <laughs> he is the minister of god god has sent him now that police officer if that thief has a gun and he's going to kill you what do you want that policeman to have do you want him to have a gun a bigger a bigger and better gun <laughs> Now, what does it say here that the back in Bible days, they didn't have guns. They had what? Swords. Did they use the swords to give spankings? 
<laughs> they use the sword to what? To kill. So, and I'll, I'll just leave it here. But here's the question. And it's a very emotional question too, and one that has a lot of disagreement on. Mm -hmm. Don't answer the question, but the question is, do you believe in capital punishment? Yeah. Do you believe the government has the right to take someone's life? Now, if you say no, I don't believe in capital punishment, then, okay, here's the thief, the gun is drawn, and the police is coming in, and he's going to shoot you. But the government says, oh, sorry, I can't shoot that guy because you, we don't believe in capital punishment in our country. That's, you know, so when we talk about capital punishment, let's start like where with something where we can really relate to. <laughs> so question, do you want the police officer, you're good, you haven't done anything bad, here's a man who wants to kill you, do you want the police officer to, to let him kill you or take him out right there so you can be safe? I've I want never him. heard capital punishment stated in that way. But it's it's easy to find as a deliberate, like, the person's caught, and then you decide what to do with them. Right. Okay. That's capital. Uh, okay. I, no, but but ultimately, capital punishment is the right of the government to protect its citizens locally and globally. So we could talk about like a situation like this, but I think from there it works out. To does a government have a have the legal right to declare war to a country that? could also come into our homes and kill us? In certain cases, yes. And does the government, should they have the right, like there's this, did you hear about this terrible guy in Spartanburg, South Carolina right now? So he had like a big plantation and he had, he chained up a woman, and they found this woman and now they're finding dead bodies on his property. This guy's a total, total menace. And if, and in such cases where it's very clear, I, be, I believe definitely, for the safety of the rest of us, somebody like him, he, sh he, should, he should receive capital punishment too. But I believe that the government has the right in those situations to take a life in order to protect. And that's Genesis 9-6. So anyway, um, a roundabout way to say this class is now complete. <laughs> and you guys can get home tonight. And, uh, and God bless you.